Take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to the book of Luke, chapter 2. We started a series through the book of Luke and find ourselves in this very familiar passage this morning. Let me just say that while the story of the incarnation is familiar, it should never become old, right? We mentioned that before. How amazing that God would become man. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. We're going to begin by, first of all, considering the account of Caesar's decree and the account of Jesus' birth. We find that in verses 1 through 7. I want to read that and make a couple of comments and then move forward and kind of uh, look into the outline that's on the back of your bulletin concerning the angel's declaration, the shepherd's motivation, and Mary's contemplation over all the events that surround this particular text. And so we find ourselves in verse 1 of chapter 2 this morning, the book of Luke. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. And this was the first registration when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each one to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed. Let me just stop there a minute. The word betrothed is an important word. It means that legally they were husband and wife, but they did not consummate their marriage until after uh, Jesus was born. And so Mary and Joseph come to Bethlehem, and it says that uh, his wife Mary, his betrothed, was with child. You know, it's interesting to me that uh, more than likely Caesar, uh, being a very powerful ruler at that time, just assumed that he was in control, that uh, he could snap his fingers and make things happen, and everything fit into what he thought was most important and best. I find it interesting that in reality God was in control. And I say that because this very decree that Caesar makes is what God used to bring Mary and Joseph to, to Bethlehem in fulfillment of his word. So again, we see the sovereignty of God right off the bat as we begin in this text here in the 2nd uh, chapter of Luke. Verse 6, And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. By the way, uh, no place for the Lord Jesus is a theme that we're going to see over and over again, whether it's in a manger, uh, an inn, or in the hearts of uh, people. But it's interesting that Bethlehem, the name, means house of bread. It's the perfect birthplace for the one who would one day declare, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall never hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Well, the divine broadcast, I guess we might call it, of this wonderful event made it clear uh, that this birth in Bethlehem, in this stall, in this uh, manger scene, uh, was significant. That it was a unique child. Uh, Wearsby writes this, while he was weak as any other baby, humanly speaking, he was also the center of power as far as heaven was concerned. And so as we think about that, we begin this morning with this, with this divine broadcast, with the angel's declaration. And we pick up in verse 8, and in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were fear, filled with great fear. This is the third time in three messages that angels appeared and everybody was in fear. Uh, obviously, this was uh, something to behold. Zechariah in the tabernacle, the angel appears and he's in fear. Gabriel again appears to Mary and says she was troubled and fearful. And now we have them appearing to, uh, have an angel appearing to the shepherds and they were fearful. And verse 10, the angel said to them, fear not. Well, that's good, right? In all three cases, that was pretty much the very next phrase that uh, the angel had to say. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angels a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those in whom he is 
well pleased. First off, notice with me that their declaration was good news to all people. This good news that the angels declared is something that extends to all nations. This is good news for people who are poor or rich, who are strong or who are weak, who are religious or who are the chief of sinners. It is good news for all people. The question, though, is this. What is the good news? Well, the good news is that a Savior is born. Amen? Amen. It's not just a religious teacher. This was not just a reformer. It was not just a wise prophet. It was far more than somebody who was just going to come and be a good example. They announced the birth of a Savior, which, by the way, is and was exactly what mankind needs, a Savior. And the good news for all people is that he is the Savior of anyone who will come and believe from every tribe, every people, every single tongue. One commentator writes this, this Savior was the one whom God had provided and appointed from all eternity. The one who had been long promised and much expected from the beginning of the world. And who, being God as well as man, is able to work out a great salvation for great sinners. Most important, I would say, is that this Savior... Christ the Lord, the Messiah, declared himself to be the only way, the only truth, and the only life. No one comes to the Father except through him. And we need to understand this morning that forgiveness and salvation are exclusively through Jesus Christ. There are a lot of people today, maybe you're sitting in this auditorium and you're one of them who are trusting their own good works, or maybe your religious activities like baptism or membership or communion or confirmation to somehow put you in right standing with God. Well, I want you to understand the scripture is clear that before God, our own self-righteousness is inadequate and it is unaccepted. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved through faith in that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works. A second time he says that. Lest we as men would have a reason to boast in our own righteousness. Isaiah 64, 6, we are all as unclean things and all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Listen to me very carefully this morning. It is only when you come by faith and place your trust in the person and the work of Jesus Christ, that you can truly know salvation and forgiveness of sin. This is, by the way, the good news to all people. A Savior has been born. The angel's declaration. The next scene in our series of events in this text this morning have to do with the shepherd's motivation. I want you to look at 15 through 18 and then jump down to verse 20. When the angels went away from them into the heavens. By the way, I could spend a lot of time talking about Can you imagine what, a, what an event that must have been to witness on behalf of these shepherds? You know, one angel and then a multitude of angels. The sky lit up. The music. I mean, it, it must have been just absolutely awe-inspiring. I, I can't imagine what that would have been like. And now the angels leave and the shepherds say to one another... Let us go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. When they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. And the shepherds returned, verse 20, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and all they had heard as it had been told to them. Let me ask you. Have you ever wondered why it is that God chose shepherds to be the first to hear about the Savior's birth? I mean, of all the possibilities that are out there, why these shepherds sitting out in the middle of nowhere with a bunch of sheep? I thought about that, and I remembered that we stated last week that God blesses the humble. Do you remember that statement that we made? God blesses the the humble. And I have to think that just as Mary's response 
to God working in her life, being marked by a humble submissiveness. Do you remember what her statement was? Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Do you remember that, that, that humble, submissive spirit that, that Mary showed toward what God said to her through the angel? Uh, it would appear that the shepherds now demonstrate a continuance of God choosing to exalt the humble and the meek. In fact, I think what you're going to find as we continue through the book of Luke that that is a ongoing theme with regard to God working in the lives of people. Historians tell us that among the Jewish people during this period of time, shepherds were considered some of the lowest of the low. The Jewish Talmud, we've referenced that before, it was a collection of civil and religious Jewish laws, inform us that shepherds were held in such low esteem that they were not allowed to serve as witnesses in the court. They, they were considered to be liars and cheats and were exempt from being able to serve in that capacity. It also states in another place that no one must help, or no help must be given to the heathen or to the shepherds. Kind of tag them on there next to the heathens. And in light of the angel's declaration that the Savior's birth was good news to all people, though, Trapp writes this. God, to show that he respected not persons, revealed this grand mystery to shepherds and to wise men. The one poor, the other rich. The one learned, the other unlearned. The one Jew, the other Gentile. The one near and the other far off. I read that and again I'm reminded that God resisted the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. So may our lives be marked by Christ-likeness as we seek to cultivate a spirit of humility in our lives as well. But the declaration of the angels then motivates these shepherds. And I want you to see that immediately they say, let's go see. Let's go see. Perhaps the shepherds had some kind of prior knowledge to this promised Messiah. Referencing the Talmud once again, we're told that the sheep that were intended for daily sacrifices in the temple were fed in the Bethlehem pastures. And Gill states that this semi-sacred occupation no doubt influenced these poor toilers and specially fitted them to be recipients of the glad tidings. They would hear much of the love law in the solemn rituals of the great temple in delivering sheep. They would know, too, that there was a rumor widely current in those days that the long-looked-for Messiah would soon appear and that their own Bethlehem was to witness his appearing. Now, whatever the case might be, when they are told by the angels the identity of this newborn Savior, Christ the Lord, the shepherds don't need any further explanation. It says they went with what? Haste. Right away. They didn't sit around. Did you see what I saw? Are we sure that we saw what we saw? Are we sure that we believe what we heard? I mean, there was no debate. There was no converse, conversation about whether they should or shouldn't go. It says they went with haste. And they found Mary. And they found Joseph. And they found the baby Christ child lying in a manger. They believed what the angels told them. And they found it to be true. However, I also want you to notice that the angels or the shepherd's response doesn't stop there. Take a look at verse 17. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning the child. In essence, they said, let's go tell. <laughs> let's go see. We believe. Let's go see. They saw, and then it says they go and they tell. They didn't keep this message of good news to themselves. I mean, after all, it was good news for what? All people. And let me tell you what, they made it known. As I thought about that this week, I realized that just as the shepherds made known the good news, folks, we too have the privilege and the responsibility to do the same. We certainly do. And sadly, there's a lot of Christians, maybe you're again one of those here today, who are quick to say, well, I'm thankful for those that feel the call to evangelism, but that's just not really my spiritual gift. Can I say that whether you like it or not, you are a witness if you call yourself a Christian? Francis Schaeffer once stated, we live before a watching world. 
And it is incumbent then on us to remember that our behavior, our words, our manner of speech, our attitudes of heart are always being judged by non-Christians. Unbelievers are always drawing conclusions about Christ and the truth of Christianity from everything we do or say. And with that, there are two particular passages in which the apostles call all believers to be involved in the work of evangelism. Colossians chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech be always gracious, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each person. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 and 16. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who ask you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. So the words of the Lord through his apostles is very clear. Look, it's not just the pastor. It's not just the teachers. It's not just the evangelists who have this task of evangelism, of sharing the good news set before him. Rather, every believer is called to be ready to give a reason for the hope that you have and to make the most of every single opportunity. Piper writes, in all we do, we should try to glorify God by bringing the great news of salvation to others. The overflow of the heart informs the mouth. If the heart is grateful to God for reconciliation with him through the gospel, then it will want to testify of that. Folks like the shepherds, may we too make known the good news about the Savior. Well, lastly, our text this morning informs us of Mary's contemplation. Mary's been through a lot <coughs> All the way back there when she was just going about her daily activities of the day and Gabriel appears and gives her that amazing news that she has been chosen and favored of God and would become the mother of the Christ child and all that, that was going to entail. And then certainly the nine months of her pregnancy and people probably questioning and rumors flying as to how this young lady who is not married is now pregnant and you know, now they come to Bethlehem and the baby is born and all of these things going on in her life. And it says in verse 20, Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. Two things we see, she treasures these things. The Greek word translated treasure means to keep within oneself, to keep in mind lest they be forgotten. I think Mary is someone who sought to remember every single little detail surrounding the conception and the birth of her son. Whether it was the words of Gabriel the angel, perhaps at night when it was quiet, she was there with her own thoughts, just rehearsing all that Gabriel had said to her that day. Must have been a very amazing thing to think about in the process. And then you remember the blessing of Elizabeth on her. And then again, we have this visit from these worshipful shepherds, all the supernatural and the extraordinary activities of the past nine months. She treasured them in her heart. Dr. Barnes puts it well when he writes this. Here is a delicate and beautiful description of the feelings of a mother, a mother who forgets none of those things which occur respecting her child. Everything they do or suffer, everything that is said of them is treasured up in her mind. And she often thinks of those things and anxiously seeks what they may indicate respecting the future character or well-being of her child. She treasured those things. Notice, secondly, it says that she pondered these things. The Greek word translated ponder means to bring together in one's mind, to confer with one's self. Wiersbe writes, when Mary said, let it be to me according to your word, it meant that from now on, her life would be part of the fulfillment of divine prophecy. <laughs> let me tell you something. That gives you something to sit around and ponder, right? And each day added to this ongoing chain of amazing events that in one way or another impacted this 
young woman's life. And understandably, it's not to be expected that she could grasp it all. But you know, it's very interesting. As with the very beginning when Gabriel came and spoke to her, in each of these new phases of her life, she bowed herself in a very quiet, trustful faith. She waited and she thought. It's an amazing picture of a mother who is contemplating all that God is doing, not just in her life, but in the lives of many people through the life of her child. The angel's declaration, the shepherd's motivation, Mary's contemplation. Through the responses of the angels, through the response of the shepherds and Mary, we learn that this simple birth in Bethlehem was, in fact, a glorious event. All pointing to the fact that this was not an ordinary child. It was God become man, the Savior of the world. The question before us this morning is this. How will you respond? to the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. The shepherds' belief was immediate. They went with haste. What about you? What about you? Do you believe that this baby born in Bethlehem to Virgin Mary is indeed the Son of God, the Savior? Do you believe that his life, his death, and resurrection are enough to pay for your sin and to free you from the bondage of that sin? Have you, by faith, trusted in Christ for your salvation? If not, I ask, will you humble yourself this morning, turn from your sin, and follow Jesus Christ today? If you have trusted Christ as Savior, here's the question for you. Will you proclaim it? Do you proclaim it? The angels came to share they rejoiced in the good news of the birth of Christ. They broke into song. They gave glory to God. The shepherds, man, they told absolutely everybody they could about what they had seen and what they had heard. What about you? What about me? Will we proclaim the good news of the gospel? Will we seek to tell others about the Savior born as a baby in the manger? He came in such a simple, humble way. And yet as the King of kings and as the Lord of lords, he is worthy of our faith, he's worthy of our obedience, and certainly he is worthy of our worship. Come, come to Bethlehem and see him whose birth the angels say. Come adore on bended knee, Christ the Lord, the new King, God. Father, we thank you for the account that you give us this morning in the book of Luke. We're thankful for the declaration of the angels. Good news to all people. A Savior is born. We're thankful for the response of these faithful shepherds who with haste go in belief and see what has come to pass and then tell, declare it to all that they can. Father, we're humbled by the response of Mary, who in faith and trust and submission treasures and ponders these things, knowing that you are going to accomplish a great work that you set forth. Father, I pray that today, if there be one here without Christ, that they would recognize the fact that this one, this little babe in the manger was truly the son. Savior, God become man, and that today, through the Word of God and through the Spirit of God, that you would work in their hearts and draw them to yourself, that they would recognize their sin, confess that sin, repent, and by faith put their trust in you. For those of us who know Christ, may this be, as it was for the shepherds, a motivation. Father, that it would stir our hearts to recognize the people around us who are lost, who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ is their Savior. Father, I pray that you give us boldness and clarity to be able to speak truth into the lives of those that you bring into our path. We're going to thank you for what you're going to do and accomplish in each of our lives in Christ's name.